Welcome to Information Security Project, ISOL 699. This is your capstone. So this is a view of pretty much all of networking and about your class, about what some of the stuff you should have learned over the last few uh, years. So we're going to start with some networking security and you know how important it is the day-to-day -day operations. Networks get violated every day throughout the uh, world and this is kind of just an overview of how we can prevent it and some things we should be doing. Uh, information security over the last 20 years it has changed so much. When I started we had hardly had any network security. Uh, we just put stuff online, it didn't matter, it wasn't, we didn't worry about hackers. Well now that's totally changed. The whole world is being hacked. Even uh, you remember the uh, presidential election they're claiming was hacked. So it is, it's definitely changed over the long term. So basically, what are we trying to do? We're protecting information. Uh, you know, we have our network, we have our computers on it, but it's data. Data is what's valuable to everyone that we see. You see all these breaches, whether it's Target or Equifax. People want that information. Information is money. And, you know, this is why it's such an important thing that we protect everything that we have. So we're going to look at information security includes information security management, computer and data security, and network security. These are the big things that we're going to be looking at uh, today. So security layers. First thing is the network security. You know, it protects components, uh, computers. It just allows us to protect what's going on, that whole network. We don't want anyone in it that's not allowed hence why we have logins and passwords and even on the internet every place you go you have to log in and put a password in if you want any information there they're trying to protect it physical items in the area uh, personal security we want to protect the people making sure that they have what they have even though people in the IT world is one of the biggest breaches we'll talk about that in a little bit and uh, protecting details of activities, sales, uh, income, whatever it is. We don't want anyone to have that information. And we also want to commit, commit, uh, protect communications, media, anything we put up on the web. We want to make sure that it has it. Some of the things, some of the terminology, assets. We have to allow people to get into where they need to go. Assets, organization resources, you know, information. Information is money, as I mentioned. We have to prevent an attack, someone trying to get into our information to take what we have. Control, safeguard, countermeasures, security mechanisms, policies, procedures. These are all the things that we put in place to kind of protect everything that we have going on. Uh, exposure, our property. You know, when we create, uh, whether it's programs or diagrams or whatever we have. Intellectual property is a big part of that. Uh, literature, art, logo, all that is important. Uh, risk, obviously there's risk being on the internet and we have to kind of reduce that for our employees and everything that we have. Uh, object tar target, what are they looking for? So when we're on the internet, what happens? Information gets passed back and forth to our servers, to our computers, and someone's trying to hack what we have. That's this center right here. This is our, this is the internet. This is where we have problems. And we're going to talk about encryption. We're going to talk about VPNs and how all this is protected. And we try to do our best to protect the data that we have. We have the threats. As I said, that's someone getting into. This is what hackers look for. What are our weaknesses? How do we respond? How do we let our employees in as easy as possible but keep out the bad person? This is what hackers are looking for. Uh, what are we trying to keep information? Obviously information we need to be readily available for when our employees need it. And we have to have them do it without jumping through hoops. So we have to walk that fine line. What's available? Uh, and how hard is it to get to for our employees? Because the harder it is for employees, the harder it is for them to do their job. But in the same token, we can't make it too easy because then hackers can get in. We've got to make sure the information is free of errors. You know, sometimes hackers aren't looking to steal data. They might be looking to change data. So we need to make sure that our information is unchanged and that it's free of any errors. 
And obviously we want to protect confidentiality. Who's the data owners, custodians? These are the users. These are, this is the data part of it. Again, that last one, integrity. Is it uncorrupted? Is it left to it the way it was intended, that there were no changes to it? And then we just have utility, uh, possession, and privacy. We want to keep everything private. We have legal ob obligations to both our shareholders, to the company, to the employees, to everyone, our customers. So we have to make sure we meet those legal obligations. So here's our security py triad, pyramid. We have to keep our data confidential, we have to keep the integrity up, and we have to keep availability. These are an important part of whenever we're designing security models, that we keep this in mind, that if the data is not available, it does no good. If we don't keep it confidential, that could be other issues. And the integrity of it, is it always correct? That's a vital part of what's going on when we put together our security and from data. And this is just a diagram. And then we're going to see this other diagram of how data is represented. Again, we have confidentiality, we have availability, and then we have how are we going to store it? And we have integrity. So how do we store it? Policy education technology, uh, storage, processing, transmission of it. These are the areas that we have to take in mind when we're looking at our information and how we're going to do uh, get information out to where we need it. Information security must balance protection and availability. As I said, we want to make it easier for our, our employees to get it, but not so easy that anyone can get into it. So it's a big balancing act that we have to allow, that we can protect against threats, but allow employees to do it. And business needs. Well, as I mentioned before, we have to protect the data, but we have to let our employees do their job. So there is a fine line between between how much information we allow employees to get to, how fast we allow to it, how much login and passwords do they need to put in to protect it. But the business has to come first because if they can't do their job, then we have no business. So we have to put these safeguards in place. But again, we have to, it is a fine balancing act. And protecting the functionality is general management and IT's management's responsibility. Enabling safe operation of the application. Do, are our applications secure? Can anyone get into them? Are they third-party applications that are housing our data? These are some of the questions that have to be addressed. Or are we going to build our own applications in-house so this way we know what the code was, there's no holes in it. So this goes into what IT is and how we keep the business function needing. Uh, we got to keep the data readily available for everyone. Uh, and when it's being used, it's easy to get to. And when it's not being used, it is secure. And how much information do we have? How, what is the cost to protect it? We have a whole, anytime we connect to the internet, there's a whole bunch of threats throughout the world that can try to get it, our information. Human error, accidents, employees, mistakes, or failures. That happens quite a lot. Whether they enter something wrong, we can't control it, but we do our best to train uh, our employees to make sure that they have information that are available. Uh, we don't want to compromise our, you know, what the people have put together. We have espionage we have to deal with. Information extortion, that's become a big thing. Ransomware. Sabotage. Uh, disgruntled employees. Uh, look at Snowden. He was not happy with what was going on. Look at all the information he stole, and he left in uh, the let it out. Theft. Software attacks is a whole bunch. We're going to go into those a little bit more, a little more detailed. Denial of services. Uh, that happened not that long ago to uh, Amazon. They were down for a few hours. But in the last two, or last couple, uh, let's see, software attacks. We've talked about that. Forces of nature. One company I worked at, we were hit a cur with a hurricane. And we didn't have power for 10 days. We had to keep the IT up and running on a generator to allow the rest of the world to do. But what is your disaster recovery? This affects how you know the rest of the country is going to do it. You know, our, you know, the other one, you have a service provider at a company. What are they doing? What happens if they go down? Uh, are you going to be able hardware failures? 
do you back up your servers? Do your servers have redundancy in them? Uh, software failures. They could be bugs and codes and upgrades. This one is a big one. Your systems are working. Well, when do you decide to update? Uh, we were actually running a Windows NT machine up until two years ago because it was uh, stable. But obviously, it's been outdated. The technology changes. So at what point do you say we have to upgrade? And these are some of the areas that companies need to look at and protect against. So we have a cracker who cracks or removes software protection. We have the cyber terrorists, which you hear about all the time going on. Like I said, the president election was, was, ter was attacked, uh, hack systems, hackers try to gain access, and the cyber activist disrupts, inter inter uh, disrupts and interferes with the operation of protest. Malicious code, malware, computer viruses, how do we protect against them? Train your employees, worms, Trojan horses, back doors, rootkits. These are all issues that every company needs to address. What are we going to do when you have a uh, Trojan horse where you get a picture of a kitty cat that everyone opens up? Oh, look at the cute kitty cat. Meanwhile, it's downloading some malicious software. So this is what some of the things are. You have to train your employees. You put in, should be running uh, antivirus on all your computers to prevent this from happening. So these are just so many other things that we need to uh, need to protect against. Software pri uh, piracy. What happens if you have a code that you wrote in your uh, for your company and someone steals it and uh, sells it for someone else? So these are some of the things that, as IT security, we have to work about it. So attacks on information security—they're always there. Someone's always going to track try to get onto our servers. Uh, if they're successful, they can do as simple as some simple things as uh, one place I worked at, they used it as to download illegal movies and they'd send all their friends to download it from our servers. So our servers got overwhelmed. Uh, something as simple as that. Some of them are more malicious. They want to steal information. Some want to destroy information. Uh, wasn't that long ago an email went around, uh, I love you virus. It down, it, it deleted a lot of information. So you have to be aware of all these things going on. Malicious code is state of the art malicious code attacks or worms. Use several attack vectors to exploit uh, different vulnerabilities. These are just some of the things that are out there that we have to be aware of. Here are some things that you've probably all heard about IP scan. They just are looking for anything that, that's what happened to one of ours, one of our IP addresses on outside a firewall, someone found it, and that's what happens. Web browsing, you click on something, you activate it, it downloads infective software by just clicking on a website. Uh, viruses, depending on how they get to you, unprotected shares, mass mail, sending infectious emails to everyone. If your employees open them, it downloads it and attacks all the servers and spreads by itself. So these are important things that we have to protect against. Obviously, password attacks. Uh, someone trying to break in through, uh, by using a password. So we want to make sure that we tell our employees not to use one, two, three, four, five, or not to use the word password as their password. Uh, they try to guess passwords. Uh, when I was working in IT, it was very common. I walk around the desks. A lot of employees keep their password on a sticky note right on their screen. Uh, and it took many months, if not years, to get people to stop doing this because uh, we have visitors come in, they'd see passwords, they'd be able to get back home and get in. So it's important that you train your employees. Uh, brute force attacks on passwords are scripts that will just run, uh, trying every combination that they possibly could. And the dictionary, if you're just using words, just run a dictionary against your passwords if they get your user ID. So these are some of the things we're going to look at. Denial of service, DOS. Uh, and what this does, it takes thousands of computers. It, you know, Usually what happens is a denial of service attack. Uh, what it does is coordinate. It, first of all, it distributes software on all these random computers around the world. And then at a certain time or uh, the package is released, 
and then every one of these computers try to get to the same website whether it's Amazon or Facebook or uh, Microsoft and the servers are then overwhelmed and they crashes because it can't handle any of the uh, fake try the fake connections trying to connect so this is becoming more popular and it is an issue that we have to try to guard against again so here you have your computer you don't even know that it's attacking the server up here and other servers and it's just constantly all these things are, they're known as zombie computers uh, hundreds of computers if not thousands of them are used to attack someone's computer so it, it gets so overwhelmed with all this traffic that it can't handle it spoofing is an interesting thing and the technique used to gain unauthorized computers so basically I get this all the time I get oh your eBay, eBay, eBay accounts been hacked please click here if you click on it it doesn't take you to eBay's login and password center it takes it to a third party set up somewhere offshore most likely you put your eBay password your login and password there on eBay and now they have that information now your account's been compromised so you need to make sure that you never fall for spoofing if you know that what that IP address is or where it's going to uh, the URL is it correct uh, so make sure you check that again this is just a uh, information about how spoofing works and how it changes that firewall man the mail it's a hacker if you want he monitors packets he's just looking for certain information and let's see I think I have a picture there it is so as you send information across the internet this person intercepts everything and then he tries to figure out what it is he's hoping that you didn't encrypt it because then he doesn't have to worry about it or he has keys that he can use before this person gets it he can then change it uh, modify it delete it or do whatever he wants and when this person gets it they're not seeing what was originally sent so this is an important thing that we always use information we use keys and we encrypt all our information anything we send over the internet to make sure that this doesn't happen email attacks these could be embedded in patch in uh, emails. You click on it, like I said, you might get an email. I'll look at the pretty kitty, and there's not nothing good in there. Uh, mail bomb. What happens is they'll steal your when you when someone in your company opens it. It's usually spread through a worm. It goes to someone else's computer. They take your email address book and they send out to everyone there. And so if you have 100 employees, everyone has like let's say 25 emails and email contacts all of them get it so it really spreads fast email attacks sniffers are a little bit different in the fact that it has to be in the same building uh, they actually put a sniffer it's a the hardware device that actually goes on the uh, network so if you're in a city or in a building a high-rise building and you occupy several floors you might be running your cables through the your cables up through a common area uh, if you skip if you're on floors four or five and eight and you don't know who's on seven or someone in seven can go into this wiring closet figure out what your wires you're using and actually put a device on there to uh, absorb all your traffic so sniffers are uh, used usually in contact now social engineering this is still the number one issue that most companies have uh, and this is just use the, the people to convince it so what will happen is someone will call up and say, hey, I'm with the, your IT department. I need your login and password. Uh, and they will give it. Or whether it's a new, new employee, you might not know what's going on, someone higher in the organization. Employees need to know this. Employees need to be trained that this is something that happens, that uh, some random person can call them and ask them for information. But we don't train our employees enough to do that. Buffer overflow, this is usually when a program crashes, application errors, uh, and it can't handle it. Attacker can take advantage of it because if, it, if our network crashes, uh, when it comes back on, or our security is down, someone can get in at during that time. Timing attacks, this is when a whole bunch of attacks occur at the same time. They're pre-scheduled, they know it's going to happen and it just allows information to uh, get that. 
So how are we going to take care of it? We have a chief information officer now. These, this is a, these, both of these are relatively new to the uh, executive board, keeping information safe and making sure that everyone is secure. So this is, these are new within the last decade or so. So information security team is going to usually have a champion. That's the one, that's usually a top executive who is going to be able to uh, spearhead it, give, provide resources for the company, for that team to work on or projects. Uh, you have your team leader, your security policy. These are the people who are developing the security policy. They must work with the information security team. Uh, security professional, sometimes you might not have the right people and staff, so you might have to bring some on. Then we obviously have the hardware portion of it, the systems, network, and storage administrator, and the end users. The big thing about end users, they have to be trained uh, on what security is about and how it affects them. A lot of companies just ignore the end user, and that's not a good thing. So what policies do you have in place? What policies are the employees have? Uh, they're usually implemented by senior management. You know, how many logins do you need? Uh, can you work remotely? Uh, basically, these are just the way the company's going to operate. And this is how we want our people to understand the policies. Whether you have a splash screen that comes up that says anything you do on this is the company property, you must not answer it, send out your uh, login and password to anyone. But you put all this in your policy to allow people to understand what's going on. Usually they're set by or approved by senior management. They go out and they come out. Standards are built on sound policies that carry weight and practice and procedures. So basically our policy starts, our standards, and then this is how we get down to the users. This is what the users are going to use. Management policies for information security, planning, design, and employment. And the criteria is how do we get it out? Who reviews it? How often to review it? How uniform is it? Or is every company, is every department doing the same thing? Enterprise inter information security policies. Someone uh, where I used to work, we were a large shipping company, we were worldwide. Every, in this case, for when I first started there, every uh, region or every country had their own policies. Uh, it wasn't until right before uh, a couple of years ago, they actually imp implemented it enterprise information security policies. This will allow every department or in every country to ensure that they have the same general basic security. Some, some, uh, some of the regions had higher standards, but we had at least the minimum that we had to meet, and that had to change worldwide. What are some of the things we're going to look for? A statement and purpose. What is our policy for? information security elements. What do we want to put in it? What do we need to secure the technology? Uh, who's responsible for it? And reference to other information technology standards and guidelines. What else did we have to put in there? And this is kind of a, just an outline of what a policy would look like. The ISSP or issue specific security policies, state organizations positions on each issue. Use of company-owned network and internet information, use of emails, uh, use of personal equipment on company networks. Are you allowed to bring your own computer in or your laptop or your phone for that fact? Uh, some companies don't want phones connected to their network. Is it is uh, a leak? So these are some of the things. What are the specifics used? System-specific policies. Guidelines, technology, implementations, and configurations, access control. You know, if you work in accounting, you don't want the person over in book or in uh, sales to have access to your information. If you have very limited access to who can see what certain information, uh, and a lot, it does keep your system safer. Do so you have a blueprint or a framework on what's keeping it? You know. What's the concept? How are you going to go laying this out? You don't just start putting in a policy. Figure out what do you want to put? What is the basic design going to be? What is our implementation going to look like? You have a roadmap of how it's going to be secure. Uh, what are we going to have security models? Is it publicly available? Is it going to be free? Do we have to have information on it? Is it reviewed by government professionals? And what documentation is available? 
Benchmarking is a great, great way to see how the industry works and what is out there. Uh, if you're a small company, do you need to spend a million dollars to protect your data? Probably not. So you want to benchmark and see what, what other companies your size are doing uh, to uh, make sure the security policy is good enough. Uh, you have federal agency websites, SANS Institution. Down here you have a couple others that you can go to and take a look at to help come up with a, a benchmark. And these are just more ideas that you can put into uh, your benchmark area. Redundancy. Implementing multiple types of technology. Uh, redundancy is a good thing to have. It allows you to have a uh, case of server crashes or your firewall. You might have multiple firewalls up uh, that are transparent. If one fails, one takes over. What is, you know, define the perimeter. What is outside your, out, your network? Uh, both electronically and physically. So these are some of the things you want to look at. So basic, some network fundamentals. Sender communicates, message to receiver, over something, internet, email, whatever it is. Communication occurs when the recipient receives, processes, and comprehends a message. And it's a one-way flow, or it could be a two-way flow. Emails could be two ways, information. Sender sends to... Uh, Send an email, here's our message, and the medium is over any wire, internet, uh, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Receiver gets it. Why do we want a network? Well, data communication. Obviously, we don't live in a shell. We have to communicate with other people. Uh, exchange of information, sharing resources, and it just allows the company to flow nowadays. Modulation. What is the medium carrying it? Whether it's analog, public clone messages, commercial radios, or signal amplitude, or frequency, or phase, it's just all how we're going to go about it. We have networks. We have peer-to-peer -peer networks. Server-based is the most common, and distributed server is also used a lot. We have a local area network. That's usually within a basic building, uh, relatively small. A uh, metropolitan area network. Think of... Uh, company that might have a half a dozen buildings, whether it's Google or Facebook, they have their own little city. Well, that's just a metropolitan area. Then we all use wide area network uh, to transmit data. The different types of topology, we have our bus, which is just a straight line, star and ring. These are more common today than the uh, bus. How do we get across either wide, guided wires or ungu unguided wires, radio information, Obviously, the firewall is vital to protecting what we have. Here's a general layout of uh, how a firewall works, protects our employees. Here's our workstations. This is our company. We're behind a router. We're behind a firewall. We also have a DMZ that will have a switch that will have, here's our internet. Notice how far away. We have an internet router. We have a firewall. So notice you have two firewalls nowadays protecting it. These are by department, most likely. Uh, this would be one department. Here's another department. It allows us to have information, control the data. Where is it going? Uh, and how is it working? So we can have our firewall scan for viruses, repairing effective files, sending alerts, providing VPN. We'll talk about that in a second. Making sure the user are who they say they are. The firewall can perform a lot of different functions for us at the company level. But basically, its main purpose protects everyone behind it so that the thieves, hackers, uh, spoofing, it allows us to get all that information. We can have HTTP traffic coming through the firewall. We can have an FTP. But this allows us to protect what's going on. This is the, our front line, if you want, and allows our information to be protected. We have a VPN link. This is a virtual private network. Basically what happens is we have, here's our private network, here's our partner's network. Instead of going through the internet like this, we create a tunnel, if you want. Think of it as just the connection between us and them as a tunnel. No one can see our data as it passes through. It goes through our firewall directly to them. And it's protected if you want, if you put it as a, in a tube. But this allows us to send data to our partners 
so that we can protect what's going on. And these are just some more uses of it. Uh, I guess I have that up. Uh, so one thing if you notice here, we have ports. If you notice between the last one and this one. So when I send information out, I might use a very specific port going out through my firewall. And that also limits the filter, the traffic coming in and out that I can't allow anyone in uh, if they don't know our port number. It protects our resources. It also allows us to figure out where stuff is coming from. It has an audit trail. We can see who went out when, where, how. Uh, performs packet filtering and application proxy. This is the seven layer network, right? Physical data link. These are the seven layers of our network. Well, this is how each one allows us on the packet firewall, how it uses this information. Packet filtering, key, fund, key function of a firewall. It can stop data looking at header, data, or trailer footage, types of information. What am I looking for? It can also packet filters. Rules, what do we want to set for the rules on the packet filtering? Access control, regulates admissions into trusted areas. So basically, like I said, if I work in sales, I shouldn't have access to accounting. Or I shouldn't have access to IT or, uh, you know, so each area could be locked down. This is usually done at the IT level, uh, identification and all that processes it. These privileged members shouldn't have a lot of information, need to know. Well, do you, does the sales team really need to know about accounting? Probably not. And accounting doesn't need to know about sales. So it's not, you just limit to who has access to certain areas of your information. Functional characteristics. These are just some of the things that when we're putting together our system, what are we going to make sure it happens? Mandatory access controls, control enforced by computer systems without intervention from the data owner. These are your logins and passwords and some of the information on there. Authentication. What do we put? Something you have, a password. Something that you have is a smart card, fingerprints. So, obviously, minimum should have a password. Smart cards are keys. Uh, these are great to have if you're going di to be dialing in from home and you want to protect your information to make sure that they have what they have, what, who they are, has what they need. Uh, now we're getting into fingerprints. You could buy laptops that have fingerprints or iris scans or even voice prints nowadays. This is just another level of protection that ensures who, who they say they are, they are. It's authentication of who's that. Uh, some passwords. We talked a little bit about cracking. I'm trying to guess what the password is. Uh, it's easy enough to steal. But what are your guidelines? How often do you have people change their password? Uh, some places I work, it was every 30 days. Some, I've worked at companies, they've never made me change their password. Uh, so they don't enforce it too much. Here's some examples of what it should be. Eight characters, at least one uppercase, one, one number, uh, contain no part of the user's name, contains no word commonly found, no repeating characters. Uh, so these are some of the things that you want to make sure that you put into your password. This is when you're creating your password, you can say it must have this. It must have that. And this way it makes a stronger password. If you just use words from a dictionary, well, someone can crash a dictionary against passwords. You want to make sure you don't allow those. They talked about you want to change your password frequently. Uh, remember the last 10 so you can't repeat them. Uh, what happens when it attempts? This is after three or five attempts, lock the user out. Don't allow simple passwords. Don't store on paper. We talked about that. I, when I work in IT, they would just have it posted on their computer. Don't allow employees to share their password. One time, past time passwords. If we have a guest that comes in, we might set them up as a, uh, as a guest. And give him a password. That password's only used for one login. It allows security. He got into the network, did what he had to, whether he's making a presentation or he's doing some kind of audit. 
it allows at least we can get them into the system, but it's only used one time. Virtual private networks, VPNs, it connects users remotely. Uh, VPNs now provide point-to-point -point communication over the internet, but it encapsulates it and encrypts the data. So basically, think of it as a pipe running through the internet that no one can get to. A lead pipe protects, you, protects your data. Allows employees to work from home or to connect. Extranet. Uh, the extranet is an extension of the organization using the internet. And it allows us to, to uh, whether we're connecting with a, let's say, a vendor, they want to be able to connect uh, to us so they can see how, they, you know, that we can build them through the extranet. They can look at their product line, uh, inventory levels. Where the intranet is strictly for employees. So if you work for IBM, IBM has their own intranet, and it's only information that they're going to have, such as the, maybe the employee handbook, vacation days, uh, some standards that they want you to file, special announcements. But again, this one is for employees only, and this is usually for your vendors and suppliers. Here's an example of the uh, of a VPN. So you can work from home. If you're a home worker, you can log in. My partner uses the extranet, right? He's a vendor. He's going to supply product, so he sends it through this way. Another vendor uses an extranet, and again, he's connecting, so he can look at his inventory levels. He can see when he's doing. He could bill us. He can. We can even pay him through this. So the VPN just sets up nice way. Uh, there's hardware devices and software that makes it up, and where uh, terminators uh, at each side of it to make sure that the data is all encrypted. VPN tunnel, so you can see the packet sniffer. We talked a little bit about that before. Program or device that views data transversing the network. Network adapter allows adapter to see all traffic coming in and going out, so we can see what's going on. Uh, consider for capturing network, maybe illegal, uh, depending on the company. Companies must be placed on network segments. Must know the sniffer is connected and it cannot decipher encrypted traffic. Okay, get rid of this. Wide area net networks started in the 1900s, 1990s. Broadband radio, these are just uh, bandwidth radio communications, 2.3 gigahertz, 54 megabytes. Modulation, how do we convert it? You know, computers are uh, digital. Phone lines are analog, so the modulation has to uh, figure out what's going on and how are we communicating through it. Wide area, uh, uh, that's the same slide. Wi-Fi. So these are the uh, certifications, Wi-Fi Alliance, 802.11, and supporting the advanced encryption standards. Uh, WAP and WAP2 is the addendum to it. And this is just a protection for when we're using Wi-Fi and how it's going to be protected. Obviously, now we use y uh, Bluetooth and WiMAX. Uh, these are for close up to uh, Bluetooth is usually between communications, usually your phone and your car, uh, something on that or a printer. It's usually very local. WiMAX is standard device for geographical dispersed facilities. So basic up to 30 miles. So if you're going to have buildings close to by, you can use that. And these are just some other standard wireless standards that are used in the industry. Components of internet security. Securing websites. Securing the various servers interconnected. FTP. If you have to send files. File transfer protocol. Simple method for transferring files between computers. It allows us to figure out how to send data secure methods. Requires two TCP ports and can operate in active or passive mode. So I could set something up at night to send it over. Software and firmware defects. They're the biggest issues that uh, ITP professionals face. Buffer over ones we talked about, string problems, integer overflows. These are the areas that come 
issues. C++ is an old program. Object oriented. It's newer. Attacks can be modified. Uh, contents of a class. And this is just some of the things that we need to be concerned about. Command injection, failure to handle errors properly, information leak. Race conditions and poor usability. These are just the major areas of, phone, of firmware that we have to worry about, software. Not updating easily, executing code with too much privilege. This is a big thing. Sometimes you might have to, the, an update might say, hey, it needs root command. Well, if it needs root command, they, know they have access to your entire complete system. This is something you should always check out. Uh, weakness introduced with mobile codes. Use weak passwords. We talked about that already. Weak random numbers. So we want to make sure we don't use that. Using cryptology incorrectly. Making sure we have it. As you know, if you're taking my other class, you know more about that now. Failing to protect network traffic. If someone is eavesdropping. It's also known as war writing. That's how a target got hit about three, four years ago. Someone sat in their parking lot and they were able to get on the network and saw all the traffic going out. And that's how they ended up getting passwords and, and accounts. So war driving is an issue. DNS, you know, uh, uh, what is our name? Apache's the uh, software client. Some weaknesses for passes processes and procedures. One of these examples and solutions that we have to look at. How do we find these vulnerabilities? Well, sometimes you can pay someone, but we should do a vulnerability mapping to see what's happening. Penetration testing. You pay someone to try to break in. Give them a time frame. They just do it. Hopefully they don't get in. Scanning tools that are used. Attack mythology. used to collect information on the attacker. Tracking events, logs, audits. IT should have audits performed. Any action on the system device, security events, operating systems, services. These are the things that should be audited on a, on a regular basis. When does the user log on or log off? How many attempts do they have? User starts and stops network sessions. These are some of the things that should be audited to ensure that the information is being good. Resource events, recording every possible detail for auditing. Network connections, who's connecting? What data leak leakage do you have? System restarts and shutdowns. These are just things that should always be tracked so you know what's happening. happening. Uh, keep track of everything. When is it called? When is someone log in? When are they logging out? How long were they on? What information? What size of the information did they get? There are legal matters we need to do. Search and seizure. Seizure. Private sector's requirements to search an employee's computer. Was the employee made aware that the computers belong to the company? Anything they do on it could be used against them. Search authorization responsible by the manager. Must notify authorities when an incident violates civil or criminal law. State, county, and city law enforcement agencies must be brought in. Uh, if you do disadvantage involving law enforcement, they might take control. They might need to see the data that you're trying to protect. The analysis team analysis performs special trained digital forensics. Recover deleted files. Reassemble file fragments. Uh, you know, did someone delete something they didn't have? Can it be recovered? Presentation, documentation. These are just some of the things that have to be done, looked at. Pre-packed field, field kits. Uh, jump bag contains portable equipment to go out and do an investigation. Purpose of cryptography. Why do we put information? We want to make sure it's confidential and secret. We want to make sure it has integrity. Uh, we also want to make sure it is authentic. These are the things why we're going to put something in cryptology, encryptation. Uh, hard drives. 
flash drives uh, where we worked or if you put anything into the computer the flash drives were all had Microsoft bit liker locker on it also the uh, computers the hard drives were so it wouldn't allow anybody to get information uh, digital signers is a common use basic terms we're going to take plain text turn it into cipher deck text the idea is that no one can read it uh, we want to keep it confidential. We want integrity, authentication, and non repudiation which means we positively identify who sent it. This is the, basically how it works. We send plain text. It's readable. We have our cipher. Our encryption happens here. And it comes out as unreadable. This is what we would then send over the Internet. The algorithm is that main part that does it. It is the program that does all our encryption for us. Think of it as a formula recipe. You put it, you start here. This is where my algorithm would sit, and it converts it over. We have asymmetric. It's used for different keys to encrypt and de-encrypt. It's not ideal for bulk data. Slow on larger volumes. Symmetric, use the same key to encrypt and de-encrypt. Ideal for large volumes of data. What is a key? A key is, is a... Uh, Information, it's basically a lock, may have many combinations to it, but that is allows you when you decipher what you're doing, whoever sent you the ciphered text should give you a key so you can on so you can de-encrypt it. That key tells you how you encrypted it. Represent main strength. The longer the bigger the key, uh, the more the stronger it is, the more complex it can be. Uh, here's some basic key length. Basically, if you look down here, if your key is up to 256, it's near impossible to break. You have Kirchhoff's principles that you want to keep your secret secret of the key. Uh, algorithm can be made public, but the key is made secret. Hashing provides a way to validate data. Uh, it's used in digital signatures. It's not encryption of the data, but it gives it a, a specific output. So hashing is just a way that we, uh, we use it a lot for downloading information. Uh, it allows you to know that, hey, that file you transferred was the right size. So hashing is just another way that it supports the data. So that's, a that's an overview of what we've been working on uh, for your project today. So, yeah, thank you. Have a good day.